Okay, go ahead. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a pleasure to be able to meet with you and to fellowship, and we'll be looking into the subject of the kingdom, the kingdom of his glory. But before we start, I'd like to read a prayer thought, and it's taken from it's taken from uh, a book called From Our For Our uh, Father Cares, page two hundred and twenty-five. I'll be right with you. And it starts out as follows. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Luke 17, 21. The government under which Christ lived was corrupt and oppressive. On every hand were crying abuses, extortion, intolerance, and grinding cruelty. Yet the Savior attempted no civil reforms. He attacked no national abuses, nor condemned the national enemies. He did not interfere with the authority of administration or administration of those in power. He who was our example kept aloof from earthly governments, not because he was indifferent to the woes of the people, but because the remedy did not lie in merely human and external measures. To be efficient, the cure must reach men individually and must regenerate the heart. Some of the Pharisees had come to Jesus demanding when the kingdom of God should come. Luke chapter 17 verse 20. More than three years had passed since John the Baptist gave the message that like a, like a trumpet call had sounded through the land. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. And as yet, these Pharisees saw no indication of the establishment of the kingdom. Jesus answered, The kingdom of God cometh not with outward show, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God begins at the heart. Look not here or there for manifestations of earthly power to mark its coming. The works of Christ not only declared him to be the Messiah, but showed in what manner his kingdom was to be established. It comes through the gentleness of the inspiration of his word, through the inward working of his spirit, the fellowship of the soul with him who is its life. The greatest manifestation of its power is seen in human nature, brought to the perfection of the character of Christ. So our study today, by God's grace, uh, will show that the glory is to manifest or reproduce the character of Christ in us, and that is done uh, by a close connection relating between the Word and the working of the Holy Spirit with the individual. So at this time, we can have a word of prayer before we uh, start in our study. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy holy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we thank you for this privilege to come before the feet of your throne at this hour on this thy holy Sabbath. We thank you for your keeping grace and the ministry of your Holy Spirit and holy, holy angels to guide us into all understanding and righteousness. So, Lord, as we come before you at this hour, please bless us with a deeper and clearer understanding and also a desire to confess and repent of our sins and make your kingdom and your righteousness our first order of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our 
Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, I'll continue on. The establishment of the kingdom of glory. Our subject is on God's kingdom. What we have studied and learned of our, our Lord's return, being with him for 1,000 years in heaven, then for eternity in the new earth is true. These doctrines are rooted firmly in the word of God and are the grand hope of the church today. However, there is one aspect of the subject that we have overlooked. We will be looking at that aspect of the kingdom and how it will impact us today. Let us consider this statement by the pen of inspiration found in I'm sorry, I skipped one. Councils to Writers and Editors, page 37. It says, We have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who will think they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. As long as we hold to our own ideas and opinions with determined persistency, we cannot have the unity for which Christ prayed. Another statement is found in Council on of Sabbath Work, page 25. There is yet much precious truth to be revealed to the people in this time of peril and darkness. But it is Satan's determined purpose to prevent the light of truth from shining into the hearts of men. If we would have the light that has been provided for us, we should show our desire for it by diligently searching the word of God. Precious truths that have long been in obscurity are to be revealed in a light which will make manifest their sacred word. For God will glorify his word, that it may appear in a light in which we have never before beheld it. These references tell us that we should diligently search the word of God. For God will glorify his word, that it may appear in a light in which we have never before beheld it. We are to learn many things, but unlearn many, many things. We trust and hope as we look into the scriptures that you will prayerfully remember these heaven-sent injunctions. To begin our study, let us turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and we read as follows. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Jews expected the Messiah to establish his kingdom in their day. With the promise of the birth of the Messiah, Christ, also came the promise of his kingdom. 
and the apostles expected the kingdom in their day as well. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, just prior to the ascension of our Lord, the disciples asked Jesus this very important question. In Acts 1, 6 and 7, we read, When they, therefore, were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. In this passage, the Lord did not say that the kingdom was not to be established, but that it was not for them to know the times and the seasons. The Jews and the apostles had studied this promise and were expecting Christ to set up his kingdom at that time. This indicates that the kingdom was not to be established in the time of the apostles, but when the time was right, it would be. I'd like to pause at this junction. Are there any questions or comments before we go on? Okay, if you have any questions or comments, just um, click on the question mark, add it to the queue, and your hand will be recognized. If you dialed in, star six, be added to the queue. Okay, I guess we have no hands, no questions, no comments, so we can continue. Okay, we'll continue on. So these questions still remain for us. Does the Bible tell us that this kingdom of Israel and Judah is to be restored? Does the Bible tell us when God's kingdom of glory is to be established? Does the Bible tell us where it is to be located and what the purpose for, uh, for it? Yes, it does. To find our answer, let us start uh, Daniel chapter 2. This again is a common pass to us, but there are some things here that we may have missed in our previous study of Daniel 2. In Daniel 2 verses 41 to 43 we read, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of part is clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron as much as thou sawest that the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves I'm sorry, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. We recognize this passage as applying to our present time. The ten toes represent the political powers in our day. Some are strong like iron, and others are weak as clay. In one testimony, page 360, paragraph, paragraph 3, we read, We need not and cannot expect union among the nations of the earth. Our position in the image of Nebuchadnezzar is represented by the toes in a divided state and of a crumbling material that will not hold together. Uh, before we go on, we, we noticed that 
uh, the Bible uh, tells us that uh, they're going to try to cleave together, but they will not bind and hold together. And we'll see as we study more and more of the Rod message what will be the final analysis uh, of their efforts. Let us now read Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, which says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Therefore, we conclude that the promise to restore the kingdom to Israel is to be fulfilled during the time of the ten toes, not before or after. That means during our present world. God is to establish his kingdom while our present kingdoms are ruling. Also, God's kingdom, the stone, is to destroy all the other kingdoms as it grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. But before we go on to our next uh, reading, uh, we, we see when you look at the entirety of God's plan for, for the earth, as mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it was God's intent that the earth should be populated with godly creatures. And we'll see that the, the full and completion of, of the kingdom, as it will be established in the new earth, or the earth made new, uh, will finally reach that accomplishment. But steps along the way the Bible deals in uh, with, and, and starting with the establishment of God's kingdom in, uh, in the Holy Land. So again, it's, it's, it's to see when we get to the question of what, what, what was the purpose of the kingdom, we'll talk more about that. It is important to notice that the stone is the same as the kingdom because they both smite the image. Also, that the stone was a kingdom before it smote the image. And it, the kingdom, Shall, stand, shall destroy all these kingdoms, verse 44. This proves that the kingdom is established before the finishing of the gospel and the second advent. Evidently, the early pioneers believed that God was going to set up his kingdom prior to the destruction of earthly kingdoms, for James White wrote in at the book Adventism on page 82 and 86. In this particular reading, it established that the kingdom would come about in, in steps and stages. And just as we had read before, the overall comment that the kingdom was actually uh, in its stone condition when it would come into first existence. And as we look at the overall plan of salvation, we'll see that the setting of the kingdom is the, is the trigger point, so to speak, of all the rapid uh, series of events that will take place that will finish the gospel in the earth and bring forth a great harvest unto the Lord. The establishment of the eternal kingdom is by a succession of events the first of which occurs prior to the destruction of earthly governments, page 82. And in uh, the kingdom, in its stolen condition, is uh, contemporary for a while with the perishable kingdoms of this world. Hence it is said that it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, page 86. Why would God want to establish his kingdom on earth before he comes? To answer this question, let's read Prophet and Kings, 
page 19. The children of Israel were to occupy all the territory which God appointed them. Those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true God were to be dispossessed. But it was God's purpose that by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn to him. To all the world, the gospel invitation was to be given. Through the teaching of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be lifted up before the nations, and all who would look unto him should live. All who, like Rahab the Canaanite and Ruth the Moabitess, turned from idolatry to the worship of the true God, were to unite themselves with his chosen people. As the numbers of Israel increased, they were to enlarge their borders until their kingdom should embrace the world. But ancient Israel did not fulfill God's purpose. Before we go on, I'd just like to bring in uh, some, some points that I think that we consider, and I'm much, one I've mentioned before, that it was God's purpose to actually populate the, the earth with, with God, uh, godly uh, people. And um, another purpose for the God's kingdom is to, it brings out, a, uh, it, it puts to rest, it will put to rest, rest uh, accusation made by seven, uh, by Satan. And that was mentioned in Pro Patriarchs and Prophets, page 77. And that, that accusation from Satan was that God, uh, God's law could not be kept. Or God's root, or God's law could not be kept by man. But before Christ comes in the clouds of glory, there won't just be 144,000 godless servants, but there will be a great multitude which no man can number. And that will prove beyond any doubt uh, that what God says will happen and that Satan's accusation were really not true. So again, we'll see that there are many other purposes as we study the Bible uh, that, that uh, oppose and advances uh, righteousness in those who liberally partake of God's word, uh, which will guide us, and with the uh, help of the Holy Spirit, develop the character that God wants to instill in us as his people. Ancient Israel was to be God's avenue of revealing his character to the world. God intended that the earth was to be filled with righteousness from border to border. But ancient Israel did not fulfill God's purpose. God's purpose is to be fulfilled with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That which God promised, I'm sorry, proposed, purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. Never has the Lord been without true representatives on this earth who have made their interests their own, his interests their own. These witnesses for God are numbered among the spiritual Israel, and to them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people. Prophet and Kings, page 713. I'd like to pause at this juncture and see if there's any comments before we go on or questions. Okay, if you have any comments or questions, uh, just hit the question mark on the lower left-hand portion of your screen if you join by internet. If you dialed in, uh, dial star six and you'll be added to the queue. All right, so we have one quest, one hand here. Yes, Mr. Robert, what, um, could you tell me what I thought? 
Would you repeat? What was the thought? What was the prayer thought? Where did the prayer thought taken from actually? Okay, the prayer thought okay. was the taken from thought was taken from a book called a book called Father Cares. Father Cares. It's on page two hundred and twenty five. It's under this all the God's kingdom in the heart. Brother Terrence, somebody in the room would you have my mic on? Can only one person have their mic on, please? No, only one person has it's the mic on. It's only one. I'm speaking, but we, it's breaking up. So when you respond, somebody responding. has to turn off their mic. Turn off their mic. Oh, must be that. Be a microphone. Thing. Or the speaker, whatever it is that you're using. Hello? Yes. Yes. I don't know. Not here. Did you get the um did you get the reference? It off. Hello? Did you get yes. the reference? Yeah, um can I get a re reference now? I took off the mic. No, no, I haven't because um it wasn't clear. Brother Dwight, can you repeat the reference, please? Okay. The reference was taken from For Our Father Cares, a book called For Our Father Cares by Sister White, page 225. And that's for August the 1st. So, could you say it again? A, a car was passing. And, yeah. Okay. <laughs> The prayer thought is taken from a book by Sister White called mm -hmm. Thought and Father Cares, page 225, and it's under August the 1st. August the 1st. Okay, thank you. Um, he's breaking up a lot. I don't know if he's breaking up. He's breaking up. <clears throat> okay, are there any questions, further questions or comments from anyone? I have nobody else questioning, so I guess we can move on. Okay, very well done. Oh, one minute, uh, Terrence again. Brother Terrence. No, I'm a person by mistake. I just put back on the speaker and it came back on automatically. Okay. Okay, you can go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead. Therefore, even though ancient Israel did not fulfill this commission, God did not return to him void. Thus we see that we see what ancient Israel failed to do, it will finally be accomplished through the purified SDA church, modern Israel. Where is the kingdom to be located? Let us read Psalms 105 verses 8 through 11. He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham, and his oath with Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. These verses describe that the covenant is and definitely reveals that God will remember it forever. The covenant states that unto thee thy get land of Canaan. The place where the kingdom is to be established then is in Palestine. If ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Galatians chapter three verse twenty nine. 
further proof of the kingdom will be established in the land of Canaan. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 3 and 24, we read, For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall possess it. When is this kingdom going to be established? Verse 24. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath done it, and until he hath performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it. What this means is that the kingdom is to be established in the land where God gave to our fathers. That land, of course, is Israel. This promise of restoration is unconditional, and it includes the return of Israel and Judah, all 12 tribes, to the land of their fathers, Canaan or Palestine. We are also told that this is to be fulfilled in the latter days, verse 24. Note, when Jeremiah was writing, only two tribes existed as a nation. The ten tribes had been scattered many years before 721 B.C. Up to this day, they are completely assimilated among the nations. Thus, Jeremiah could not have been referring to this time. Neither could his prophecy be speaking of the uh, identifiable Jews of today, found in Palestine and other parts of the world. Since they too are descendants of the two tribes, Judah, Jeremiah refers to all 12 tribes returning to the land of promise. The 144,000, who then is Jeremiah referring to? The 144,000, they are the ones found to be from the 12 tribes of Israel. Revelation 7, verses 5 through 9. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. And so on. They are, the tri they are the only tribes of Israel noted to be living in the latter days. They are the first fruits, Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And the stone of Daniel 2 that make up the beginning of God's kingdom. So these are references just simply indicating these are the descendants of ancient Israel or bloodline of ancient Israel. Now God has a perfect record in heaven and he knows when everybody was born. He even knows the number of the hairs on their head. So there's, there's a proof positive in the Bible that uh, this, is, this is rock solid in terms of the descendants of uh, ancient Israel. Let us now read Jeremiah 23, verses 5 through 8. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, the old days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say, the Lord liveth, 
that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries whither I had driven them and they shall dwell in their own land. Jeremiah 23 verse, verses 5 to 8. Uh, this, this reference makes it clear that it was actually God who drew, drove his people out of the, the land of promise. And, of course, we know that's because of idolatry and many other sins that were practiced, in spite of him sending prophets to reprove and, and, and correct his people. Now, let us turn to Jeremiah 23, verse 20. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he hath executed, till he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days ye shall consider it perfectly. Once again, Jeremiah makes it plain that God's people are to return to Canaan, or the promised land, in the latter days. In fact, Jeremiah states that God's people will come from every country where he has scattered them and will bring them back to their own land, which is the land of Israel. The same truth is brought uh, to view in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, which says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without, a, without an image, and without an ephod, and without teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. A good point of this, this particular reference, it says God's people will seek him, and as, as we read more and more of, of the present truth message, we see how we are being admonished today to seek the Lord. We'll seek uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so we look forward to fulfillment of these, these promises that are, are given to us. And not only do we look forward with understanding, but we look forward with compliance, allowing the, the word of God uh, through our obedience to sanctify us and purify us and to lead others, too, to the, to the good news of the kingdom, the, the good, gospel, uh, good gospel news of heaven. Here we see that after many days of obscure wandering, without their own government, king or prince, and without the temple and its service, services, sacrifice, ephod, teraphim, and so on, all the tribes, 144,000, will return to the land of their fathers and establish a kingdom in the latter days. It is talking about our time. We've heard Jeremiah's testimony as well as Hosea's. Now let us look at Isaiah. Isaiah will not only tell us when the kingdom is to be established, but also who are its subjects and what it will be like. Let us read what Isaiah says in chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5 reads, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not Judge after the sight of his eyes, 
neither reproof after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 5. This, of course, speaks of the branch. Jesus is the branch, the one who is to do all these wonderful things. Now let us read verses 6 through 12. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockroach's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand as an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patros and from Cush and from Elon and from Shina and from Hamath and from the Isles of the Sea. And, they, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. I think we'll pause at this juncture and see if there are any comments or questions um, on what we've gone over. Okay. Uh, we have another hand here. In Isaiah 11, let me see, and shall make him of quick understanding. All the time it refers to he and him, where the Lord said that he will... Um, Make the, because he start out with a branch, and a branch shall grow out of the roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Is this talking about the the hundred and forty four thousand? Um, and is it referring? It, it's refer saying a him and and he, but referring to the hundred and forty four thousand as one. Because they would be of one body, so the, he's referring, so the him and the he is referring to this group of, um, this body of righteous um, people that, that God is um, just calling him as one, because that will be the governance of the kingdom. Uh, in, in the context I'm trying of, to understand, because um, it doesn't mention, and we know that it is, in the end he says, he will bring this branch out of Judah, so we know that it's the 144,000, but it just refers to he and him when it's speaking of all the different things that will happen. Uh, in, in the context, it, uh, it's my understanding, he's actually... Uh, Isaiah is speaking of Christ himself. Now we know the concept of Christ will perfectly reproduce in the 140,000, but it's 
my understanding is the uh, focus is actually on Christ himself. Oh, Let me see my phone. Uh, because it goes on to talk about how you will not, will not judge by your parents, but will judge in righteousness. Yeah, I know. We, it, he breaking up. You're not getting it. Mm-hmm. If you have... And if you if two of you have your mic on, one of you need to turn it off. No, my phone. It's only one phone. Because one phone and it's my phone is charging. That's why I can't use it. Do you and have it on a, on a speaker or something? Yeah, but we, we took off. off the speaker to hear you, but we're not hearing when the speaker is off. You're going out. You're going silent. Okay. Can you repeat, Brother Dwight? Yeah. Yes. Uh, did did that uh, answer your question, Sister Denz, or did that share any light on I didn't other get any up? answer. That's what I'm saying. I didn't hear your okay. answer. Okay. In, in the context of uh, Isaiah chapter 11, the he here mentioned, uh, the main focus here is uh, referring to Christ. Okay? And uh, because it said, the, we know that Christ is the branch. Okay? And though his... Our character will be perfectly reproduced in the 144,000, which will be the kingdom in its infancy. Uh, we will see the main focus. One minute. One minute. One um, minute. One okay. minute. While Brother Dwight is answering, uh, mm-hmm. Brother Terrence, can you mute your mic until you're ready to okay, speak no again? Okay. Yeah, uh, the, the last things I said, did it go through? Uh, just just start over again. Okay, so the, the, okay. Uh, if I understood the correction, uh, the question, it was asking, was uh, those the Bible references referring to the 144,000 or to Christ? In the context that he indicated uh, that that it would actually main focus would be on Christ himself. But we do know that the character of Christ will be perfectly reproduced in the 144,000 who will be in the kingdom uh, from its infancy onward. And of course, with the great multitude that will come in as well. But it talks about the judgment uh, of, of the he who is referring to Christ. And uh, he will not judge according to what what the eye will be actually uh, saying, he, he will judge in righteousness. In other words, he, he doesn't, he sees the heart. He can actually see the, the intent and the, of the heart and so on. And so the, right, the, the kingdom will be established, as we know, in righteousness. Unlike all the other kingdoms that came before the setting up of, of this kingdom. Would any further comments or questions? Anybody like to add anything to that? We have some other hands. Yes. Uh, okay, let's move to the next person. Sister Burley. Yes, good day, Reverend. Um, there's a phrase that says, in the latter days, he will consider Consider it. Is that a maybe? So could you explain to me what it means when uh, the scripture says, in the latter days, he will consider it? Thank you. In, in Bible language, the, uh, the whole uh, purpose is to emphasize the certainty of it. It doesn't mean that there are any, um, any doubts or in, if, or about it. About it. Matter of fact, it, it, uh, inspiration tells us it, there is no, there's no degree of uncertainty. It's non-conditional. So in other words, whether an individual hears this message, whether they believe it or whether they choose not to, it's not going to hinder or keep God's word from being fulfilled. 
So the choice of words in the Bible is that he has this on his plan. That's his agenda, which means he considered them, which means he, he's not going to forget his words that he promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for the establishment of the kingdom in the land that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it, it just wanted to bring the point to us that God has it on his agenda, and he, it will happen. And his word is not going to come back to him unfulfilled. And so he just wanted to impress upon our hearts and minds uh, the purpose of the Bible and then using those, uh, those choice of words. Uh, was that helpful to you? If I may add, um, the definition of the word consider is to view attentively, to sit by, to sit, see, sit. The literal sense is to sit by or close or to set the mind or the eye to, hence, to view or examine with attention. In other words, the people will see the kingdom and they will say, wow, look at this. So in that sense, they are considering, not in doubt, but they are paying close attention to what has just transpired. Thank you. And, and we see the Thank love you. of God. Yeah, we'll, we'll see the love of God for humanity. In the world as we now know it, for, to the degree that we are alerted to what's happening, God's people, God's true and faithful people can't stay under these conditions very much longer. And we see all the signs that the Bible has given us of the coming of his kingdom. Now, the world doesn't know that God wants everyone to make up their mind and know what their options are before they decide. And so the kingdom, as, as we go on further, the kingdom is the crowning is the crowning act of the plan of salvation. It's like ice on the cake. It's what finishes all all off. And so God is saying that I, I, I love the world so much that I sent my only begotten son to die that humanity could be saved. So he's certainly not doing, going to forget that sacrifice of which he made and, and will be fulfilled. Uh, if we use the terminology, you can take it to the bank. Well, the banks are going to fail. We know that but the word of God will not. And we can be assured beyond any doubt that what God says is what he means, and it's, it's for sure. There's no, no doubt about it. Now, sometimes because things don't happen in the time frame that we expect it, uh, we may have some degree of linger and lingering doubt, but there should be not, because God's word is certain. That's a good okay. question. We have another hand. Yeah, thank you, Brother Dwight, for this good study. I just wanted to bring the attention to the people. Uh, in the chat section, we put a link to the new borders. Uh, we know that the Ezekiel uh, talks about, I think it's chapter 48, where there's a new division of the land. And uh, so if anybody wants to see that new division, as opposed to the old borders, uh, they can click that link in the chat section. Uh, thank you, Brother Rob. Uh, we'll be touching a little bit on that as well. Um, often when we, uh, when we share the subject of the kingdom with our brothers and sisters, uh, owing to their lack of understanding and not following on in the Bible with understanding, uh, and, and the, uh, what has not been taught to them, and sometimes in some cases... Uh, I've heard uh, people in leadership position insinuate, if not come right out and say, that it's impossible for man to keep God's law. Just do the best you can. Well, they fail to harmonize the, the truth of the Bible that is through Christ that we can do all things. And that's not emphasized, which would bring about a change of heart. And, and those things that are impossible to man, are, all things are possible through God. So that's, that's a very good point. Also, uh, when we share this particular subject, which is somewhat uh, advanced, uh, maybe for our Laodicean la brethren, is that we kind of need to take a little time and go through not only the biblical facts, but also reason, uh, because in, as we just read here in chapter 11, 
that it, it talks about three categories of children, okay, sucking child, weaning child, and young child. Uh, and some believe that in the earth made new there will be children, but this is not in accordance to the show word of prophecy. Sister White uh, comments on that. And um, she tells us that uh, anyone who really believes the Bible, the word of prophecy, cannot hold that view. So, and also we read very closely in, in these verses that God will he, will, he will bring people into the kingdom while it's established. And this must happen before probation for the world closes. It cannot be after crisis uh, placed down the center and, and closed probation for the world. So these and other kindred uh, effects that, uh, that we can leave with those that we share the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the good news of the kingdom. And again, the kingdom truly is good news. You know, the world in general has no hope. They hope to run off to some obscure place on the planet and maybe uh, grow their own food or whatever, you know, but they don't know of the kingdom. They don't know of the righteousness of Christ. So it is God's purpose through us. This is our mission. It's not just our own soul salvation that is at stake, but a lot of people who will be looking to the 144,000 as an example of what Christ can do, what God can do through us if we would totally surrender ourselves to him and follow him. Uh, is there another question or comment? Uh, there are no more. You can move on. As Adventists, we have always understood those verses to apply to the new earth, but this has to be pre-millennial. That is pre-millennial. There are are at least three reasons why this could not be the earth made new. First, the reasoning is found in verses 6 to 8. Here we see a little child leading a calf and a young lion, a sucking child playing on the hole of the asp, and a weaned child putting their hand in a cockatrice den. Where do these little ones come from in the earth made new? In Luke chapter 20, verses 34 to 36, our Lord shows us clearly that there will be no marrying or giving in marriage at his return. Let us turn to Luke chapter 20, verse 34 to 36. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. God's word here is making it plain that there cannot be any marriages or deaths after Jesus comes. Inspiration also gives us an insight into this passage. In one selected messages, uh, page 172 and 173, we read, The doctrine that children can be born in the new earth is not a part of the show word of prophecy. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. The words of Christ are too plain to be misunderstood. They should forever settle the question of marriages and births in the new earth. Neither those who shall be raised from the dead nor those who shall be translated without seeing death will marry or be given in marriage. They will be as the angels of God, members of the royal family. Plain it is that there will be no children in the new earth. From the time of our Lord returns, we shall be like angels, not marrying 
or giving in marriage. Therefore, we will not be having children, neither will we be able to die. Therefore, even if a little child is placed in his mother's arms, he will grow up during the thousand years. So when the holy city descends onto the earth, it means that all will have been fully grown up to their full stature. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 says, We shall grow up as calves in the stall. The second reason is found in verse 10. Notice that, notice what is it says, what is said, it says, and in that day, what day? The day when the wolf is dwelling with the lamb, the day when the little child is playing with the asp, in the day when the fatling and the calf and the lion and the leopard are all playing together. It says, in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Here we notice that the kingdom is to be an ensign or a standard to the world. It says that the Gentiles, or strangers and unbelievers, will seek it. The fact is that there will be no Gentiles seeking admission into heaven or the new earth after Jesus comes. But there can be Gentiles before Jesus come, returns. Thus Isaiah 11 must be before Jesus returns. So with Bible facts, we see this is very strong factual reasoning based on um, what the Bible is, is saying. The third reason is found in, in verse 11 that says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Patros, and from Cush, and from Elam, and from Shinar, and from Hemoth, and from the Isles of the Sea. No such gathering will take place in heaven or the new earth. The Lord, through the prophet Isaiah, shows that he will gather people from all over the world. The term second time implies that he it happened once before. The first time God gathered his people from Egypt only. But now he is to gather them from all over the earth. This shows again in our previous studies that the 144,000 are to be gathered and then a great multitude from every nation kindred, tongue, and people. This can only happen before Jesus returns, before probation closes. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the, Egypt, of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it into seven streams and make men go over dry shod. I want to pause at this juncture and see if there are any questions or comments. Okay, we have one man here. Oh. Hi. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I'm um, Brother Dwight, you read somewhere that he said that uh, um, a, a little child shall put his hands in the mouth of a lion or whatever, whatever something like that. Yes. Um, but you didn't, and, you, and then you went on to read about how um, we will not be given in marriage um, 
in the um and all of that. I just wanted to know, but did you clarify how where where exactly these children were? Were these children in the new earth? I didn't really get that that part. Okay. Um the the line of reasoning don't hit me yet, brother. Um thing. don't hit me yet. Go ahead. Yes, uh, the line of reason, reasoning that in Isaiah chapter 11, it clearly shows these three uh, uh, level of children in the first for the young child. And the, the question is, is, is this, this kingdom spoken of in Isaiah 11, is that, is that before the millennium or after millennium? And also, is it before, um, before probation closes? Now, after the millennium and the earth made new is eliminated because there will be no children born or no one of those who will be saved will die after Christ comes and when Christ comes. Okay? So that points back to these children must be in the uh, in, in probationary time and also must be before the millennium. Okay? Uh, did you follow that? The line of reasoning. Yes, but is there anything like that can concrete that with like something that you can refer to to say, okay, this is this is where why I I gave that reasoning. Okay, we looked at uh, one selected messages page. What was the page? Uh, one seventy two and one seventy three, and that points out the fact that there will be no births or marrying in the earth made new. So that's telling us that seeing that there's no marrying and birth, these children could not be, uh, in Isaiah 11 that is spoken of, could not be in the earth made new, but must be before Christ comes. Okay. And then the, mm -hmm. my next question is that. So since um, we were going to be like angels, I just wanted to ask that, because just a thought that ran through my mind. Was Adam and Eve like angels? Well, I, I think that there is a, I don't have it at hand right now, a reference uh, that men were close to the level of angels uh, at, at creation. If anybody has a reference on that, that uh, they can uh, uh, go to it. But I do recall reading that, I think the point of bringing out any, like angels, indicating that we would not, uh, um, we would not reproduce or we would not have children. I think that's the point of bringing out to be like angels. All right, I understand that, but remember, I'm not, I'm not, it's not that I'm advocating that there will be. I'm just trying to reason in my, reason in my head certain things. Okay, yes. If that Adam and Eve were, the fact that Adam and Eve were created and, and, and God is actually trying to bring us back to the original, which is back to everything being perfect, my thought is if Adam and Eve were able to get married, and they were well. They were married, not not in our in the mind that, that in the mindset that we have that you know they had a big wedding and they had eating and drinking or whatever. But they were married that, because that was the first example of Christ showing us what, what that marriage is something good, right? So yeah. if it is so that they were given in marriage in the perfect world, what happened? What would happen? Because He's bringing us back to Eden. So what would happen that would change that? That's what I. That's my. That's my question. Well, I, I, I'm looking at the whole plan of salvation. Uh, I come to the understanding that in the kingdom, there won't be subdivisions or uh, families as we know it here, but the whole body of believers, of faithful believers, are going to be one family. So we would we wouldn't look at uh, look for division of families as we now see it. Uh, Brother Terry, did you want to make any comments on that? Yes, um, going back to the original purpose, God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Uh, you touched on it earlier that God intended that the earth to be filled with righteous people. So because sin entered the world, those who are born are now no longer born righteous and therefore, that's why preaching becomes necessary to select the righteous from the unrighteous. 
So by the time um, that Christ comes the second time, those who are resurrected as well as those who are alive will now have fulfilled God's original plan to fill the earth with righteous people. And so there will no longer be the need to reproduce. And that's why everyone will be as angels, neither marrying nor given in marriage. Thank you. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I mean, like, I'm still thinking about this, but I, I, I understand. Thanks. Okay, then. that's a good question. Um, but let's take a, uh, some other hands. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about that picture that uh, you put up there, Brother Dwight. Um, I think that's a great picture, uh, giving us some more ideas about the travel to the kingdom. Um, we see that it says, make men go over dry shot. And uh, so I think in the message, um, it's very important to remember that there will be a, just as a, as a type where they came out of Egypt, they physically traveled to the kingdom. I think that this is very clear that we're going to make a physical travel to the kingdom as well in the latter days. Uh, that's my comment. Now, my question is, we know that um, the 200 million mentioned in Revelation 9, uh, verse six, uh, 16 and 18, um, and then you got the great multitude and you got 144,000. The land of Israel is really not so big of, uh, of area. Uh, how is this all going to uh, fit in that area? Is there any place in the message that says that the the land uh, area will be expanded into Syria, into Egypt? In other words, in the old days, is that is that how we're to understand the size of the kingdom? That, that's a good comment, a good question, Brother Rob. Uh, I do recall... Uh, uh, a source of in, in inspiration saying that uh, there's indications that things are getting a little bit crowded here. And um, I don't remember exactly where that reference is, but I, I do remember uh, hearing it. But as far as details uh, showing uh, boundaries, uh, I have not come across uh, anything that would help us in understanding that. But I think with, with the with great number of uh, coming into the kingdom, uh, those who are laity and then those who will help along with the 144,000 directly into the ministry, uh, they the, that the space will become a challenge at some point in time. I think that's that's, that's uh, understandable. Yes, I mean, I guess you know one of the things that might be helpful for us is um, to research online the the old day map of the the, the, the land of Israel. And I think that shows it going into Syria, into Egypt, into uh, Jordan, you know, into the other areas as well. So that's probably the area that will be encompassed in the in the new uh, kingdom, you know. I think that's a good suggestion. If we come up with anything, we can share it among ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make a, a comment and a reference on the transportation issue to the kingdom. And uh, one TG... Number 40, on page 19, on the third paragraph, after reading uh, Isaiah chapter, I think it's like chapter 60, verses 6 to 9, uh, Brother Hatef makes this comment. He says, our sons and our daughters in the faith shall come as a storm by air and by sea. They shall come because the Lord will glorify all his people. The call, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues, Revelation 18.4, shall indeed, along with the wealth of the Gentiles, bring out a great multitude which no man can number, Revelation 7.9. So I think uh, it's fair enough, uh, plus we, I believe it's in the um, White House Recruiter where the Lord talks about uh, uh, flying sources as a potential transportation mode. Now I think we can safely conclude that the travel mode is multifaceted. 
and even other means of which we don't even know about. But people will be coming from all places on the planets, and so I think um, that time is going to uh, is going to be very fascinating, fascinating, and, and, and exciting for all of us who are, are found faithful. Amen. 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 Okay, we have our uh, four, another four hands. For the Terrence, you raise your hand, Brother Terrence. Um, you mean? Oh. Or Desiree? You hearing me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Um, I wanted to add to the answer in terms of the question as um your sister asked about we becoming um about us being like angels and um in relation to Adam and Eve if they were if we we going to be going back to the same you know that they were perfect they were perfect so they were um if we're going to go back to that same status now the, the as far as i understand from the scriptures adam and eve were not the fulfillment of god's plan for his for the for the earth in terms of um well in terms of everything um just but they were like babes, even though they were adults. There was a, supposed to be a growth of God, to fulfill God's plan. So that in, that in that sense, they were not perfect. They were not to the level yet. Sin came and marred that and prevented that. So that where we have to, where we would um, finally come, come to would be not to their level. So we would be, because remember the word says they were made a little lower than, uh, man was made a little lower than the angels. That's how they were made, but they were supposed to grow to a certain point. And there's a reference in the spirit of prophecy. I don't, can't say where, but I heard it many times that Mrs. White says that the 144, um, you mean, that when God would have um, accomplished his number, whatever that plan was, the, 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 the um, reproduction of earth through Adam and Eve, had they not sinned, would have stopped. So, in other words, they did not get to that point of fulfillment. So when we now returning, would not be to that point either, it would be to the point where he had planned. So that is why we would be like angels. Because um, we would be, uh, we would have risen to that level where, where, which he had planned. I mean, um, the words are failing me to, to express it, but I think you get what I am, what I want to see, what I'm, yes. Yeah. But that, that is, in other words, we, not, we didn't reach up. Man never got, God didn't get the opportunity to bring man, the same man that he created, good, very good. To the level is like a seed. Um, it's it's good and perfect in its um, in in its in its beginning, but it did just didn't get to grow to that perfect the end result, and that is why we will be that way. That, that's the difference then between Adam and Eve and the the, the final course of God's um creation thank you yeah thank you sister Desiree I, I, I think you brought out the point that God's purpose his initial purpose will then be fulfilled so there's no need for and basically Adam and Eve were actually the tools when we read about uh, when we read the seals we see uh, the first seal the white horse and the man riding and having a bow and a crown upon his head and so on we, that was the means of which God was to his means or his tools of, by which he would uh, his his purpose would be accomplished. And once it's a, uh, accomplished, there's nothing needed beyond that. So I, I think you brought it up, you know, clear for us to understand. 
Okay, we have a hand from, uh, what's that, Oneida, Tennessee? Two, two, three, six, one. Hello, let me ask you a question. Maybe you have your phone muted. The phone itself is muted. Yes, I had it muted. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I, I read something very interesting this morning in the uh, story of redemption, and it says on page 58, the pure and lovely Garden of Eden, from which our first parents were driven, remained until God proposed to destroy the earth by a flood. God had his wonderful, God had planted that garden and specially blessed it, and in his wonderful providence, he withdrew it from the earth, and, will return, and he will return it to the earth again more gloriously adorned than before it was, when it was removed from the earth. God proposed to perceive a specimen of his perfect work of creation, free from the curse wherewith he had cursed the earth. So I thought that was interesting that the Garden of Eden was taken away, and it's going to be brought back to us. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we'll take the next hand. Sister Carolyn? Yes, I was just in on, you know, our board meeting. In, in prophets and talks, for to go there and there's a number of the world and world. God's purpose for Israel, prophets and kings, that what we're going to do for Israel, anciently, he put people to So I would think that our are banned, um, and not just be refined to what is termed, you know, the land of Canaan. I don't think it will be even as small as it was um, in Israel's day, because there will be and you have an army of 200 million there, and then, well, each has a jail with heads and all their converts, so they all have converts, so you're talking about a, a huge amount of people, plus all the people who are raised in the special uh, resurrection of um, Ezekiel 37, the dry bones. Yeah, the whole house of Israel is going to be joining us. So our borders are going to expand. If, so I would think that it would, um, you know, as we expand to accommodate all these people, it will basically encompass not the whole world, but a good share of that land over in that area. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have the next hand. Yes. Yes, good morning. Um, two things. Um, the Bible made it plain that when the stone hit the mountain, that stone is to become a mountain itself and fill the whole earth. So there would be no lack of space for God's people. There would be all righteous people in the earth at that time, but it shall not be only the land of Canaan. In fact, the whole earth would be the land of Canaan for God's people. And Ellen White has a direct statement. I was just looking for it. don't remember exactly which book it is in, but I might find it before your program is finished, which said, man was made to repopulate the earth. As you rightly say, um, God had in his mind just how he made a number of angels, we don't know the number, there should have been a number of human beings on earth. But because of sin, it didn't come about that way. But God is still going to have that number of persons that he wanted when everything is finished. That's my comment. 
<laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the the line of questioning was, was uh, the the closeness in the kingdom before Christ comes, that were, because of the great influx of those to be gathered, uh, space would become a challenge at some point in time. But as you brought out in the Earth Made New, that will not be a challenge. Oh, I see. I see. All right, we have a last hand here. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Um, I, I think it's in the answer book or track four. I didn't look for it, but in one of the books, Brad Hadav says, we must read every line carefully. Let not a word escape our attention. Amen. Now, um, when when you read um, that um, God is going to bring his people to the land, from different places, the, the, the word of God explained, and um, when somebody, you cited um, 1 TG 40, page 19, and it says, who will be coming by air and by sea? It says, our sons and our daughters in the faith shall come as a storm by air and by sea. They shall come because the Lord will glorify all his people. This call, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her place, Revelation 18, 4, shall indeed, along with the wealth of the Gentiles, bring out a great multitude which no man can number. So it is the great multitude that is coming by air and by sea. But Brother Hadith tells us how the 144,000 is going to get there. In 1 TG 11, he says, be ready to board the chariot of God. He didn't just say a chariot. If he did say a chariot, we can say plane, or we can say car and bicycle and motorcycle. But he said, be ready to board the, ch the chariot of God. And he explains what the chariot is in White House Recruiter, page 10. He says, yes. to be sure... Elijah called them chariots, but if they were not flying saucers of some type, how did it get, come to earth? So he tells us how we're getting there. With the chariot of God, which some people call flying saucers. And then on page 11 of the White House Security, he says, And if the flying saucers are indeed the Lord, then what else are they come for but to deliver everyone? whose name is found written in the book, Daniel 12, 1, and to slay those who oppose them, Isaiah 66, 16. So, brethren, don't let us confuse it. The great multitude is coming by air and by sea, and the 144,000 is going in the chariot of God, which is not bus and airplane. It is the chariots that Elijah saw, in, and Brother Hadith puts it, in 2 Kings 6, 17. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Deborah. Yeah, that context does uh, specifically talk about the great multitude of such. And uh, in, in uh, White House Recruiters 10 and 11, uh, he said that it's not so much the concern of what they are, but what they will actually do, and that will provide transport for God's people. Also on the road, there's a point where he stated that when, to be ready when the angels say all aboard. So let us strive to be ready. Praise the Lord. Okay, we can move on. Okay, continuing on. And thou shalt be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Isaiah 11, verses 15 and 16. The kingdom and the new heart experience. And I... In Ezekiel 36, verses 17 to 37, we read, Son of man, when the house of Israel uh, dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Therefore, I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through 
the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name when they said, unto the, said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. But I have pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all the, your filthiness and from all your idols. Will I cleanse you? A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye, ye shall keep my judgments and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and will lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall you remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, in the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities and the Wastes shall be built, and the desolate, shall, desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that pass by. And they shall say, This land was desolate, it is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. When then the heathen that are left around about you shall know that I, the Lord, built the ruins places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it. Thus saith the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like a flock. I Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 17 to 37. The key thoughts that we uh, should keep in mind are these. There is no condition to this promise. God is going to, I'm sorry, God is doing it because he had pity for his name's sake. Verse 22 and 23. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Also, when God takes us back, he will cleanse us from all our filthiness and idols. He will give us a new heart, 
verse 25 and 26. This has not yet happened. Is to become like a garden of Eden. He will take us back to the land that he gave to our fathers, ancient Israel. And we will dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be built, and the desolate land shall be tilled. It will be like the Garden of Eden. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 28, and verses 33 to 35. Note, heaven has no waste places that need to be built up or desolate lands or ruined cities. Also, the heathen will not be in heaven. Verse uh, Ezekiel 36:24. All these evidences are showing us that uh, the kingdom, the pre, is is truly a premillennial kingdom. What the Lord says, He means. The Lord says He will do it for Israel when they inquire of Him. He will also add to their numbers, flocks of men, verses 37 and 38. Before I go on, I don't think any one of us can wrap our head around what it means for just one million of individuals, and we do not know the number that will be coming into God's kingdom, but we do know that God uh, wants to give everybody on the planet an option uh, or, or before they make, uh, make before they make up their decisions to take the mark of the beast or to to be a part of his holy kingdom. So clearly, then this prophecy will happen while probation is still open and cannot be either heaven or the new earth. Let us examine some other scriptures. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 to 8, we read, Again, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If it be marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of his people in these days, shall it also be marvelous in mine eyes? Saith the Lord of hosts, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country. I will bring them, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, in truth and in righteousness. Zechariah chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. There are several things that need to be pointed out uh, in these scriptures. These verses tell us, that there shall be old men and old women dwelling in the streets of Jerusalem, and the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing. Clearly, this is to happen before Christ comes, for there will be no old men, women, or children in the new earth. In Zechariah 2, verses 1 to 13, we read, I lifted up mine eyes again, and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, 
to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O, o Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you touches the apple of, my, of his eye. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all, all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 1 through 13. Also, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. Verse 5. The wall that the Jews built in Zechariah's day was of stone, but the one here is of fire. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Verse 10. Here again the Lord comes to dwell with his people and to protect them. He will not, uh, we will not be needing any protection in the new earth. Let us read Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 15 through 28. I think we'll pause at this juncture and ask, are there any comments or questions before we go on? Okay. We have two hands. Again, if you dialed in, uh, you can dial star six to be added to the queue. Yes, good evening. Um, I just called back to say that um, the quotation I was speaking of is in the SDA Bible Commentary, page 1082. SDA Bible Commentary, book one, page 1082, or TA, I'm not sure what it is, TA 287, paragraph 2. It reads like this, God created man for his own glory, that after tests and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to populate heaven with, human, with the human family, if they would show themselves obedient to his every word. Adam was to be tested to see whether he would be obedient as the, as the holy angels or disobedient. Yeah, so that's the quotation that I was thinking of. So after God has um, gotten back the amount of people that he wanted, then birth would stop. You have no more children. That's my belief. Would you repeat that reference again, brother? It is from SDA Bible Commentary, Book 1, page 1082. Thank you. 
TA, I don't know TA, I'm not sure what is TA, 287. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if you have another hand. Um, has Brother Dwight finished commenting what he wanted to say? Brother Dwight, have you finished commenting what you wanted to say? Yes, I have. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. but my question goes to great controversy, and I was hoping, please, could we turn to the page? Um, great controversy, page three, two, one. Okay, three, two, one. my question it's paragraph two but is it possible that someone could that, that, that I could read the paragraph and then ask the question because my question um, refers to this second paragraph is that okay but it's a long paragraph um, yes go ahead for the sake of understanding yeah, for the sake of understanding. The kingdom, this paragraph mentions a kingdom, and my question is about the kingdom in this paragraph. And it states, Taking the manner in which the prophecies had been fulfilled in the past as a criterion by which to judge of the fulfillment of those sorry, which were still future. He became satisfied, he, that's William Miller, became satisfied that the popular view of the spiritual reign of Christ, a temporary millennium before the end of the world, was not sustained by the word of God. This doctrine, pointing to a thousand years of righteousness and peace before the personal coming of the Lord, put far off the terrors of the day of God. But, Pleasing though it may be, it was contrary to the teaching of Christ and the apostles who declared that the wheat and the tares are to grow together until the harvest, the end of the world, that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, that in the last days perilous times shall come, and that the kingdom of darkness shall continue until the advent of the Lord, and shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth, and be destroyed with the brightness of his coming. Oh, did you finish? Yes, that paragraph. But there's one sentence that I would like to highlight on page 322 two of Great Controversy. Page 322. Two, two, and it's the one, two, three, third paragraph, the first sentence. And it says, Not until the personal advent of Christ shall his people receive the kingdom. Okay, is that uh, sufficient for your question? Right, so that's a paragraph. Now, if I could just summarize a few points. I get from this paragraph that in William Milliam days, there was a, 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 a belief that there was to be a kingdom 
for a thousand years before Christ's second advent come in. And then when I turn over the page and I read on page 322, you know, Ellen G. White says that not until the personal advent of Christ shall his people receive the kingdom. Now my question is, how do we harmonize the truth of the kingdom that we have just studied today with the readings that is in Great Controversy, page 321 and 322. Okay, if, if I may. Uh, our close examination of the paragraph that you read on page 321 uh, points out that there's no biblical foundation for the millennium of peace, as was a common teaching uh, among the Protestant uh, nations at that time. And uh, in other words, it, it, cannot, it could not be upheld. And we have uh, understanding from the Bible of the, the judgment of the living and various other points to indicate that the kingdom of God must take place. The weight of evidence said it must come into existence before Christ comes in the clouds. Uh, even Bible indicates where uh, in, in, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 where all those are things that are all those that are thin are removed from his kingdom. So all of that points out that uh, as we read on the, the sentence that you're referring to on page 322, it means that Christ is coming for a church that is without spot or wrinkle or any such uh, um, thing, as you read in, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. So uh, there, uh, I think the, the misunderstanding of what, what was on page 321 is that uh, it was not the understanding of the pioneers, as we had read a statement earlier, that they believed that the, the kingdom would come into existence in a series of events that would uh, happen before probation comes. So when Christ comes in the clouds, the, the kingdom is already uh, been fully assembled, uh, probation is closed, and so uh, Christ is, is, is coming at that time. So that's, that's my understanding on, on that. Hmm, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Okay, we have two more hands here. Yeah, uh, Brother Dwight, I just wanted to help uh, Sister Jackie. If she'll go to two answer, page 74, uh, the Rod message deals directly with that quote that she was trying to get to the bottom of. Again, two answer, page 74. Thank you, Brother Rod. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that uh, one of the brothers had talked about the size of the kingdom, and uh, I wanted to uh, just show this comment about uh, the, the area of the kingdom, and that's found in track uh, 12, page 45 and 46. And it reads, the dragon's aim is to keep them from coming out of Babylon and thus going into the rapidly growing kingdom. Then it is, though, <clears throat> that the world shall behold all God's people coming out of Babylon's dominion into their own land. The truth now being clearly established that the scarlet colored beast is a symbol of the dominion over which reigns Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. It follows that her boundaries will extend as far as the boundaries of the nations that bow down to her authority. Therefore, the call to come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, is a call for them to come out of her dominion, uh, uh, that they share not in her sins, nor receive her plagues. Those who respond to the Lord's bidding must, of course, have a sin-free place to go to, where they may dwell safely uh, through their though there be neither bars nor gates around it, Ezekiel 38, 11. To this haven they shall, have, they shall be brought out from the nations, and there they shall dwell safely, all of them. 
So I just wanted to bring the attention that we're not going to have a kingdom that's going to encompass the whole world, but it's going to be a select area that's going to be the boundaries. Thank you, Brother Rob. You're welcome. Okay, we have uh, another three hands. Yes, I'm, I'm referring again to the quotation that I gave. In, in reviewing it, what Ellen White is saying that man was made to replace the fallen angels, the angels that were cast out with Satan. So um, this is what she's saying, that man was made to replace those fallen angels. But according to what the lady, the question the lady asks about, uh, um, about the understanding of the first pioneers, William Miller, um, we must remember that lady is progressive. And he just had the first angel's message. And the second angel would have given more light the third angel would have given more, and then Brother Huda would have given even more light. So we must always go with the newest or the up-to-date light that has been given. Um, in the army, I've never been in the army, but I understand in the army, they always tell you to take the last order. So if someone tells, give you an order, and then someone and a great authority come after them and give you a next order, you must always go with the last order. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, was there some, someone else? Brother Bernard? Uh, yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, I just want to also respond to the question that the sister was asking the great, great controversy about how we can harmonize what we have learned about the kingdom and also what Sister White said in the great controversy. We must understand that um, there are things that may not have been so clear the time of Sister White and her ministry. But she, under inspiration, told us clearly uh, that there are things that will be revealed to us more clear than we may have beheld them before. So before I go further, let me read from Sabbath, Councils on Sabbath School Work. Uh, uh, I mean, Councils, right? Uh, is it Councils on Sabbath School Work, page 25? It says here. There is yet much precious truth to be revealed to the people in this time of peril and darkness. But it is certain determined purpose to prevent the light of truth from shining into the hearts of men. Precious truths that have long been in obscurity are to be revealed in a light that will make manifest their sacred worth. For God will glorify his word that it may appear in a light in which we have never before beheld it. Now, let's understand one thing here. When we are talking about the premillennial kingdom, elsewhere, Brother Hotef has told us after giving us just the passage from the Bible, for example, the very chapter that Brother Dwight was reading from, Ezekiel chapter 36. He tells us that such passages of scriptures need no interpretation. Now my question is, several who have been asked this question from, uh, arising from the same book of Great Controversy about the kingdom. My question is, let us also sit down and think about this very, very important consideration. Where have we found Sister Ellen White dealing with Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31, Hosea chapter 3, and then she commented upon them to discredit 
the belief that there will be a premillennial kingdom before Jesus comes. You'll find that nowhere. We can search her writings. So, according to what she has written in councils on Sabbath school work, I believe this is part of what she said, that God will glorify his word, that appear in a light that we have never before beheld it. When the premillennial kingdom is fully backed by the Bible passages, that's why we are told that these passages, they need no interpretation. We have to take them the way they are written. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Ellen White has never dealt with them as chapter verse by verse. She has not done that. Only the under the rod to make us understand and also to appreciate the quotation such as this one that is found in councils and Sabbath school work to tell us that there are precious truths that are going to be revealed. And when they are revealed, they will make these sacred writings their worth, meaning why is Ezekiel 36 there? Or oh, it is because of this, the kingdom, the premillennial kingdom is to be set up present truth is not the present truth that the people had in the 1890s or let me say more especially under the reign of Sister White. What we have is the present truth. That's why there is present truth and also the truth of yesterday. So let us try to think about, you know, these verses or these chapters that we are now studying under the reins of the rod, what did Sister White say? You find that there is nothing that she said because this was not the light that was given to her. So she put it in, in, you know, uh, in perspective that these things are going to happen. We are going to understand passages that have never been understood before. So that's why we say, the writings of the uh, Sister White or the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy and the Lord agree. They may not agree on point and point, but they, may ag they agree in that she says God is going to do this. She, he's going to reveal this thing to us. And then the revelation comes telling us that what Sister White said, this is what it is. So concerning the premillennial kingdom, we may not have the full light under the reign of Sister White. But we have the full light under the reins of the rod. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Bernard. Is there anyone else? Uh, yes, we have uh, two more hands after this. Ask your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mr. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Are you hearing? Hearing me? Yeah. Yes. You have to take it off. You have to take it off. I take it off? Yeah. Mm. Seven after a friend. This is seven after a friend. Are you... Oh, gosh. We're hearing. Go ahead and answer your question. Huh? We, we hear you. Okay. The question... Uh, not a question. Brother Peralta gave two references. One from the answer a book because he was a addressing two questions two questions asked I, I don't want one from the um, answer book he addressed another question and I would like to get the reference if you could repeat that yes yeah I believe the one from uh, two answer was page 74 yeah I have that there, there was another reference that he read another reference he read the, Concerning the next question he was addressing. That uh, one I want. That's right. 45 and 46. Pardon? Say that a little louder. My phone off, oh, man. Uh, 12 track. 12 track. 45 and 46. 45 and 46. Thank you. Oh, you could wait on again. Uh, um, thank you. The, could I have the page number of that lovely reading which the brother read from Councils on Sabbath School Work? What was the page number? 
and he commented and said that Ellen G. White didn't have all the um, light on the matter of the kingdom. Please, that brother, can he give the page number, please? Councils on Sabbath School work. Okay, he'll, he'll speak next. Brother Rob? Yeah, yeah, bro. Um, Sister Jackie, am I answering Sister Jackie's question? Yes. No, I think that's another brother. Brother Bernard is the one that said the council on steps would work. Okay, well, what about Sister Desiree? Uh, yeah, yeah, Brother um, uh, Dwight answered it correctly. It was 12 track, uh, page 45 and 46. Okay, so maybe Brother Bernard can um, answer Sister Jackie's question. Right. In the meantime, we'll take the next hand. Sister Des? Des? Yeah? I, I don't hand. have it. It, it, was, it was answered. was answered. Thank you. Okay, we can move on. Okay, should I continue or someone has another question? Uh, well, hold on. One more. One more hand. Okay. Maybe that'll give us the answer. Yes, um, I just wanted to to read for all of us um, a, a quote from track number four, page seven, and it says, "Now the only safe and same procedure is to read closely every page of the, of the solemn message contained herein. Let not a line escape your attention." Study every word carefully and prayerfully. Be an, be an earnest and diligent student of the truth. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Now, when this is read from um, the Great Controversy, if I was reading it then, when it says that they wanted, they were looking for a kingdom of peace for a thousand years, I will know that is not what the Bible teaches. But what the Bible teaches is that in the book of Acts, it says the heavens must keep Jesus until the restitution of all things which was spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And the only thing that you can go to the Bible and see that all the prophets spoke about is the establishment of God's kingdom. So that when you read from the spirit of prophecy and um, you don't fully understand, then you go back to the word of God to see if that is what the word of God teaches. And once the word of God teaches, as Ellen White says, in um, Great Controversy 625, that the Word of God is the final authority. So whatever she says or anybody says, and it is in the Word of God, the Word of God is always the final authority on the Word of God. So what Brother McCoy is presenting is what the Word of God teaches, that God, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. And it is not after their day, over and over, Brother Hadav shows you in all the TGs that the kingdom is not going to be set after these people day, meaning in the earth made new. God, in the earth made new, a lot of them will not be here. Those kingdoms will not be there. It is in their day that God promises to set up his kingdom. And um, just to, to shed some light on the, the reading from to answer her, this is her brother. I'm not going to read all of them. Just read a part of it where her brother had, had answers the same inquiry of Great Controversy, page 322 and 23. But Hadith says, um, I don't know if I can pick it up here, but it says, but must the more studiously compare both views, what the Rod teaches and what the, the, the Spirit of Prophecy is teaching. And it says, both views of doctrine under the super lens of the Bible he must keep in mind that we are not given license to harmonize the Bible with any other writings, but are charged to measure all by it. So we don't have to harmonize Ellen White's, uh, the Bible with what Ellen White says. We have to harmonize what Ellen White says with what the Bible teaches. And I think if we keep those things in mind, we wouldn't go wrong. And for um, my last comment is on the space for Jerusalem with all of these millions of people coming. This is what God promised Abraham in Genesis 15, 18. It says, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham before he was Abraham, saying, unto thy seed will I give the land, this land, 
from the river of Egypt. And if I understand, and looking at my map, the river of Egypt is the river Nile. The Lord says, from the river of Egypt, um, onto the great river, the river Euphrates, which takes you all to Syria, part of Iraq. So don't worry, the space will be enough. God knows what he's doing. And God will have enough space. And when I look at the map, it even takes in Saudi Arabia. So God will have space for his people, brethren. We only have to be there. The most important thing is that we get there. We live the life so that we can make it. And we will see God will bring all things to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Deborah. Was there anyone else? Okay, I guess that's it. And um, I'd just like to add, in 2TG11, on page 16, Brother Hadith expounds on the scripture that Sister White referred to in um, Great Controversy 322, where he says, um, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Uh, just keeping it short, he goes on to say that this is his coming in judgment, not his second coming to, you know, take the saints with him to the to, to heaven. But um, this is, you know, Ezekiel 9, and of course, the judgment of the living, the gathering of, you know, the great multitude and so forth. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Again, that's 2TG11, page 16. And, uh, oh yes, Sister Jackie, um... I want to say thank you everyone who gave reference, Brother Rob, and also this reference in 2TG 1116. Thank you all. That's what I wanted, lovely references coming back at me, because when we're in the church, we need to be able to explain things and harmonize with them and not necessarily come back with contradictions or alarming explanations. We need to blend with them and to be peaceful. Thank you so much for all the references. It's been appreciated. Thank you. Yes. Happy Sabbath. Oh, also, by the way, Brother Bernard gave you the reference on... Council's yeah, where's that page number? 25. Council of Sabbath School Work, page 25. Thank you. Blessings. Okay. Okay, I guess we can move on. Yeah, uh, Brother Terry, um, time-wise, I, I can uh, just give some of the, uh, the key references and, and wrap up in a few minutes, or should we try to just go on as we're going? Okay, I'll, I'll continue on. Uh, in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 15 through 28, we see how the Lord uses... So, sorry, uh, I muted myself. Uh, do you want to continue okay. on or you want to finish it next week? Uh, I'm not sure about next week because I, okay. have, a me I have a medical appointment. Yeah. Okay, so we could uh, go till 12.30. Okay, by the grace of God, we should be able to summarize by that time. Thank you. Okay. Okay, in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 15 to 28, brought to view, uh, the Lord uh, told the servant to join two sticks together, and these two sticks would be uh, Judah and Ephraim. And then it goes on, uh, one of the key uh, verses uh, is found in verse 24, and I'll read that. And David, my servant, shall be a... Uh, a king over them, and they shall, let me start a little earlier, uh, verse 22, verse 22 down to including 24, I will make them one nation, so the two nations of, of the ten tribes of the north and the south would be joined together, and I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king uh, shall be uh, king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions, 
but I will save them out of their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them so that they may be my people, and I will be their God. Um, and David my servant shall be a king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Verse 25, And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, and they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So what we uh, just read describes in the kingdom there'll be a theocratic uh, government of such, where the figure of, of David, and much can be said uh, of, of, about that, uh, but owing to time, if you would like to read further, you can look in 2TG number 4, um, page 16 onward. Uh, it shows the type of government that will be established in, in the kingdom. Okay, continuing on. Uh, we all, uh, Brother Rob touched on the, the setup of the kingdom or the dividing of the land. Uh, we'll find that in, as we compare, compare scripturally in Joshua chapter 7, the boundaries of the land were basically from north to south, whereas in uh, the premillennial kingdom that shall be set up in the Holy Land will be basically east to west. Uh, when we read, uh, we don't have the time to read Ezekiel chapter 48, but it goes into the, uh, the detail of the uh, division of how the land will be divided. And as you see, the graphics there um, bring, out the, bring out that point. Now, this should be a real... Uh, concern of those who will see that it cannot, with all the other evidences that can be given, that it could not be um, ancient Israel that is spoken of uh, in, in, um, in the prophecies of Hosea and Ezekiel and Isaiah and so on. Okay, here are some other references that we can look at of supporting the kingdom. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 8 to 12, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, Amos chapter 9, verses 9 to 15, Hosea chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, Ezekiel. 34 verses 11 to 13 and also verse 15. Here's a reference in Signs of the Time, August the 4th, 1887, volume 2, page 138. We read, The time had now come when Satan's empire over the world was to be contested. His right disputed and he feared that his power would be broken. He knew through prophecy that a savior was predicted and that his kingdom would not be established in earthly uh, triumph and without worldly honor and display. He knew that the prophecies foretold a kingdom to be established by the prince of heaven upon the earth, which he claimed as his dominion. This kingdom will embrace all the kingdoms of the world, and then the power and glory of Satan will cease, and he would receive his retribution for the sins he had introduced into the world and for the misery that he had brought upon the human race. He knew that everything which 
concern his prosperity was depending upon his success or failure in overcoming Christ with his temptations. And he brought to bear on the Savior every orifice at his command to allure him from his integrity. Signs of the Times, August the 4th, 1887. Uh, after that statement, we can, uh, as I read that statement, I get the, uh, the urgency and intensity of the adversary against God's people. So all the more reason, we must have the full armor on, and we must be very careful to, to stay close to the Lord and to obey his every word. This study has shown us that the kingdom of God has a very small beginning, only 144,000. However, it is to grow and extend its borders by the harvest of the great multitude, just as God has intended for ancient Israel. We've also found that the internal conditions are to be different from those of any other. Uh, I'm sorry, the eternal conditions are not to be different from, are, are to be different from those of any previous earthly kingdom because it is based upon the reign of Christ's righteousness in the hearts of his people. It is to be a kingdom of believers. And that last word, believers, it, it does not mean just having a, a clear intellectual uh, understanding of what the word is saying, but those who assimilate, embrace the word, and, and that the word is actually manifested in their lives. Are we willing, brothers and sisters, to give up our plans and accept God's plans for the finishing of the earth? Let me tell you that the Lord will work in the this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things, and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 299. General Conference, Bulletin, 1909, page 149. What I want you to know is this fact, that somebody will form a part of that perfect kingdom of God. We may or we may not. We have our choice. We can do as we please, but the thing is going to be. There is going to be a people composed of representations of every tribe and nation. White men, black men, yellow men, red men, poor men, mostly, some rich men, a few great men, and a great many small men, men of all dispositions and of all races and nationalities, all the world, all speaking the same thing at the same time, all manifesting the characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is yet to be. Now, if we believe and know that the thing must be, it can be done. April 9th, 1901, uh, E.J. Wagner, and this is General Conference Bulletin, 149, uh, paragraph, paragraph 6. So, brothers and, and, uh, and sisters, as we read these things, as we hear them uttered to our hearing, this should make us all the more determined. To, 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 to be among those that the Lord can really depend upon. Of course, this is going to cause, uh, cause us some changes in our lives. We can't go on like yesterday. Each day should bring us closer and closer to the Lord. If you believe what you, I'm saying, if you believe what you lack in the Bible and reject what you don't lack, it's not the Bible you believe. 
but yourself. This is a startling uh, reality because in the Bible, Revelation 14, 4 tells us that the faithful, the 144,000, follow the Lamb whithersoever you go. That is, we accept all the truth that God has given to us as an authority to guide us uh, in making uh, decisions which have far-reaching implications, which we are not able to judge at the time we, we uh, make those decisions. Uh, in so much that if we choose not to accept what the Bible says and what the rod message teaches us, then we don't we don't really know where we're going. You know, in the book Story of Redemption, it says there was a point in time where Satan, uh, Lucifer, could have come back. He could have turned back. But even though he knew, even though he knew he was wrong and God was just and merciful and God was right and holy. He chose to go beyond that point. And inspiration says uh, he shut it within his, himself to, to think of what lie ahead. He couldn't see clearly where, where it would lead. So that's the state and condition of anyone who turns away from the word of God. So brothers and sisters, let us make a promise to ourselves that we are going to follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Thank you. Okay, we thank uh, you, Brother Dwight, for that presentation. And um, I really like that last slide. If you believe what you like in the Bible and reject what you don't like, it's not the Bible you believe, but yourself. So let us believe what the Lord has given us in his word, and then we can truly say we believe, you know, the Bible. Amen. Um, next Sabbath... We will be going into the study on the 144,000 and the great multitude. So, um, do you have any last closing comments, Brother Dwight, or should we just go into prayer? Uh, just, just very briefly, um, as has been brought out by Sister Deborah and others in the past, that we should not let one word escape our understanding. We study. Uh, the Bible uh, with the rod message and sister white. Just one word or misunderstanding of one word can really stir us in the wrong direction on what the art is really saying to us. So along with our, uh, the rod message, we should refer to the dictionary to get the applicable reference that, that as it is uh, in context in the Bible and try and pray and ask the Lord for a clear understanding. May the Lord bless us and keep us, and may we continue to grow in grace and knowledge and obedience of God's Word. Thank you. Uh, in closing with prayer, um, unless someone would like to, uh, Brother Bernard, if he would pray for us, if he's on. I saw Brother Bernard still there. You just hit your question mark. Uh, he must have stepped away. Oh, okay, I see him. All right, Brother Bernard, let me unmute you. Go ahead, Brother. Brother Bernard? Oh. Lost him. Yeah, he's not available. Okay, I'll, I'll pray. Okay, thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your wonderful promise of the restoration of your kingdom. We thank you for that which Brother Dwight has been able to share with us and for a clearer understanding as to what your word is saying. So continue to bless us, guide us, and help us that we may fit ourselves to be citizens in that soon coming kingdom. Continue to be with us our main portion of this day and may you not only be a receive a blessing but to be a blessing to others also. We pray and ask these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord. words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. 
O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 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 May the Lord be with you, brethren, and bless you and keep you. Amen. Bye, brethren. Happy Sabbath.